Amen. Good morning. How are y'all doing? It's going to be a good day today. You believe that? Hey, if you didn't get a chance, be sure that you text in here to the number on the screen. Take a couple moments to do that now. Um, also, kids camp registrations. You need to register your kids for kids camp if you want them to go. So parents, be sure to register for kids camp. Um, you may have noticed that there's this trend that God's doing a lot of stuff in our worship. And so sometimes we don't have announcements for you. That means you're going to have to learn a new skill. Is that okay? I really, I'm, I'm asking you guys. I know I usually ask for stuff for my birthday and for Christmas, and those are a long way away right now. So for Christmas this year, early, Christmas in May, what I really want you guys to do is get really good at scanning this QR code on the screen. Okay, can we all do that? Because here's the deal. Even if there are announcements, there's a ton more going on in our church than what gets announced because there's only so much time and I know you know we don't always come to church for announcements we come to meet with the Lord right uh, so just so you know there's a lot more going on than you hear about from the stage so we need to as a church family just get really good scanning the QR code on the screen it's also out right in the center of the welcome area out there you can scan it out there and it'll take you to the web page that'll show you everything that's going on in our church okay if you don't know how to scan a qr code ask the younger people ask your kids ask your grandkids they lily already knows how to scan a qr code she's a year and a half years old she does it better than i do so they know how to do it okay but we've got to get good at scanning the qr codes deal yep. all right let's stand for the reading of the word we stand to honor god's word i'm taking us back to galatians chapter 5 don't want to get too far from Galatians 5. We're in a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul says this, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or as I've put today, great heartedness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Holy Spirit, come now. As we talk about this fruit that you cause to grow in our lives, we need you today to do it. So we invite you, we welcome you, we say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, do this work in us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. All right, I thought about skipping this message because it's on patience and none of you need any help with that, right? You're all good with patience. There's a few things I want us to, uh, I want to just highlight about fruit of the spirit, some information um, about the fruit of the spirit. Can we get the doors closed in the back when we get a second? Y'all know I get distracted easily and there's just too much light coming in there, people walking around and stuff. Thank you. A um, Couple facts about the fruit of the spirit that I want us to remember. First of all, this is a mistake many, many people make. Um, we think of the fruit of spirit as personality traits. And we look at people and go, oh, that's such a loving person. They're such a, a patient person. They're such a joy-filled person. These are not personality traits that you get one of naturally, okay? Everybody nod your head so you get that. You are to embody and express all of them. Because as Ryan taught us in week one, it's not fruits of the Spirit, like a bunch of different ones. It's one fruit that has a bunch of different characteristics. So the whole thing is to grow in your life. So you don't get to cop out and say, oh, I'm so glad that I got the, the joy fruit and they got the love fruit and they got the self-control fruit, but because I'm a loving person, I can just do what I want. That's not how this works, okay? They're not personality traits. You get all of them, or you're supposed to have all of them. I'll put it that way. Um, also, uh, this, is, this is as supernatural of a work of the Spirit as the gifts of the Spirit are. Just, 
just as much as a body being healed or a life being saved, redeemed, miracles happening. This is just as supernatural of a thing. This is Paul's worldview that the spirit is going to come again and he is going to create or recreate new types of human beings. And this is what their heart looks like. This is what the prophets said. God's going to take a heart of stone and he's going to give you a new heart of flesh. And this is what it looks like, the fruit of the spirit. So it's a supernatural recreated work. You can't do it on your own. The spirit does it in you. Okay, so you've got to make that shift that, okay, this is not normal. This is not natural. Normal people aren't like this. This is a miracle of the Holy Spirit that my character would be in line with this. As Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit. All right? Who was here um, for the Eighth Day People series earlier this year? Okay, most of you. Good. If you weren't, Go hop on the app or YouTube and watch that series. This is the year of learning how to be eighth day people who are still having to think through and wrestle through and consider a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Good news is <clears throat> Paul is right on track with all this eighth day stuff. It's where it comes from. And one of the central ideas in that series, eighth day people, is that we as Christians, if people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, you actually partake of the tree of life right now. The tree of eternal life, the picture in the Garden of Eden. You can eat of that right now. And if you have that mindset and you understand that, then you're going to track with what Paul's saying because he riffs off that. Notice he says, the fruit, are you getting it? The fruit of the Spirit. What does it look like to eat of the tree of life right now? How can you tell if you're partaking of that tree of eternal life? Well, your life's going to be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He also says, verse 14, a few verses back, he says the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, Watch out that you're not consumed by one another. Again, we're back in the garden. You have two options. You can eat of the fruit of the tree of the life, the fruit of the spirit, or you can um, eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is I'm going to decide what's good for me, what's pleasurable for me, what's desirable for me, and that ultimately hurts other people. So I'm going to bite, devour, demean them for my own good. Paul's saying that's going to bring death, just like it always has since the beginning. But you have the opportunity to eat of the fruit of the Spirit and cultivate your life as a garden so that that fruit grows. How y'all doing? I had to get through like the whole Bible in 10 seconds there. So Paul says one of the things that happens if you're eating of the tree of life right now and the fruit of the Spirit is growing in your life is that you will be patient. Now, my message is called great-heartedness. And I'm going to explain that to you. Paul uses this Greek word, macrothumia. And it's one of those words that's hard to encapsulate in one English word. It's hard to get a full definition in one English word. So uh, a lot of translations, most of them will use the word patience. And we're probably familiar with that if you've gone through the fruit of the Spirit. Um, ESV, the New American Standard, these popular translations are going to use the word patience to translate macrothumia. Some of them use the word forbearance. If you're using the NIV, it's going to translate it forbearance. Forbearance means uh, you have the ability to let people be people. And they can mess up. And you can endure that. There's this popular thing out there in the world, this idea that uh, if you offend me, if you chew your gum too loud and I don't like it, if you scrape your fork with your teeth and I don't like it, we need to sit down and have this real deep conversation and hash out how that made me feel and work through it. 
Um, that is not a fruit of the Spirit. That's called being really touchy. The fruit of the Spirit says, you know what? I can have grace for people. Not everything is the end of the world. Not everything is destroying me and crushing me. I can let people be people, have grace for them. They may say things that come off wrong, that make me feel a certain way, but I have the ability to forbear with them. Wouldn't it just be better if we could all forbear with people? Um, So some translations translate it forbear. Um, A few of them use the word magnanimity, which means that's a, you know, word we don't, I don't know. That's the first time I've said that word in my life. I know that. Talk about a word you don't use in normal conversation. But it means you're, you're, you're generous, you're charitable um, to people. And so I've just taken a stab at it today, as you saw, uh, translating it, great heartedness. Fruit of the Spirit is that you have a great heart. So the reason I've translated it that way is that the Greek word thymia or thymia, which we still use in English today, um, thymia speaks of your whole internal system. And there's a lot of words in the Bible to talk about your internal system. Heart, spirit, mind. Um, A good English word to consider would probably be mood. Okay? Your internal system. System. So I just picked one, heart. We could call it great spiritedness, but great heartedness rolls off the tongue a little bit better for me. Great heartedness. Um, you can think of it like this. You can be, um, you can have or be diagnosed with cyclothymia. What does that mean? That means your internal system your mood, your emotions, your feelings, your thoughts, they kind of go up and down, up and down, up and down. They cycle. Don't really have to have anything happening to you or not happening to you. That's just the state of your internal system. You following with me? You tracking? Uh, you can have dysthymia, which is your internal system is just pretty consistently low or negative. And if you have that, um, they're going to say you have a mild depression consistently. Not severe depression, but you just kind of live in this state of being low. Dysthymia. Paul says, this is good news, by the way. There's this fruit of the spirit that's macrothymia. Meaning your internal system is great. Macro thymia, great in the sense that it is strong, able to endure and withstand. The spirit inside of you creates this great internal system. Now that was a lot of words to describe it. Let me, let me show you how this works. This illustrates it better than I could ever say it. Here's the deal. I like this one. I'll use the pink one first. This balloon has an internal system. Did you know that? Somebody nod for me. You need to wake up today. This is the easy part. This balloon has an internal system. There is air in here that is exerting pressure, and it's greater than the pressure on the outside of the balloon. That's why it stays inflated. Y'all got that? If the outside pressure was greater, then it's going to break. Now, right now, the internal system is stronger, greater, macro. And what happens is life starts to apply that external pressure, doesn't it? People start to put pressure on you. Time, this is where the patient translation comes in. You ever felt pressure from time? And what happens? That pressure squeezes Squeezes, you all waiting for it to pop, but you don't know what's going to pop. The pressure comes, and it pops. And people pop. And people come into your life, and they put pressure on you. And it pops. And circumstances happen. And everything happens, and you pop. And Paul is saying, oh, 
People who have the fruit of God's spirit, his spirit, his personal life-giving presence, they have a strong enough internal system that it withstands the external pressure of life. This is good news for you today. Somebody needs this today. One person? Is there one person in here who needs this message today? Your internal system is going to be strengthened by the Spirit. And I look around, I look at our culture, our society, and Christianity as a whole, and a lot, a lot, a lot of people do not have this strong internal system that is promised. Because people are popping and cracking and outbreaking and all the stuff all the time. They're overwhelmed, they're flustered, they can't deal with it. And uh, what you need to hear today, I'm just going to put it to you bluntly. You don't need less pressure in your life. That's what we're all looking for. I need less pressure. I need less on me. What that shows you is you don't have the internal system that's promised to you by the Holy Spirit. Are you guys ready for the fun part? You're not going to like this part. Here's some signs that you don't have a macrothymia. <laughs> if you are triggered, offended, frustrated, overwhelmed, flustered easily. If you are rushing all the time, you do not have a strong internal system. Can I just tell you the truth today? If people can press you, trigger you, and you pop, you don't have the internal system that's promised to you. If you have to go fast through everything, you know why we rush through things? Because we feel the constraint of time, and so we try to get ahead of it instead of, so that it doesn't crush us, so that we don't pop, so we move fast. Instead of developing the internal system that can just stand in it patiently, endure it and move through it with wisdom so if you move fast through things quickly through things you do not have the internal system that is promised to you the great heartedness how y'all doing okay still doing good second one how are you doing at keeping your commitments because i i don't know about you I have found the way I feel at the time when I make a commitment does not usually match the way I feel when it comes time to fulfill that commitment. Anybody with me? And what having this fruit of the Spirit, this great heartedness will do is it will enable you to endure through that to say, I'm not actually ran by my feelings or my mood. I'm actually in control of this thing because my internal system is stronger than that. It's able to endure that. So you can look at your life. You don't have to feel super guilty about it because we're going we're gonna to learn how this fruit grows. But you can look at your life and say, man, yeah, I make a lot of commitments. I say yes to a lot of things. And then I feel great about it and I'm excited and then I get there and I back out of them and I back out of them and I back out of them and I back out of them. And you can look at that and you can say, Lord, I don't have the strength inside that is promised to me by the Holy Spirit. One more. What comes out of your mouth and when. It's a kind of a little bit of a running joke around here. I don't know why it's a joke, because it's true. Um, I don't really talk all that much. Um, but can I tell you a secret? I still talk way too much. Did y'all hear me? I still talk way too much. I can tell by some of the looks on your faces, you're like, oh no, if you talk too much, I'm hopeless. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> Remember, this is a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it will take a miracle for some of you. But <clears throat> what, 
what, what happens is you start to get pressed. That pressure comes, especially by people, circumstances, and it pushes out things that shouldn't come out of your mouth. And that happens so often. We get concerned. Um, we feel people not liking things, not liking us, and it pushes out excuses. It pushes out blame. It pushes out things that should not come out of our mouth if we had the internal system strong enough to just endure it. This can even happen with uh, words and vision and purpose that the Lord has given you. Did you know that God will show you amazing things he has for your life? He will. He'll show you this is why you're on the planet. This is why you're here. This is what I have for you. And then you will be required to hold on to it until the time is right. I've had to learn um, this a lot uh, recently. We get, we get asked quite a bit, you know, did, did you ever plan on planting a church and was that ever in your mind? And, you know, different people have different answers who've been here from the beginning. But for me, the answer is, oh, yeah, for sure. I always knew uh, there would be a church. And, I, and God showed me, um, you know, several years ago, the, the vision of it, the culture of it, what it would be like, the worship of it, the teaching of it, the ministry of it, a whole lot of stuff about it. I had that in my heart. Now, in my mind, I was thinking I'd be in my 50s when that happened, but here I am in my 30s, so that's a different, different teaching for a different day of God's timing. But what I've had to learn is what, what we want to do is we want to just vomit all of that out because people have questions, people want to know, people got all, and that puts pressure on you, and there's things happening that puts pressure on you, and you want to just, here it is, this is what it all is. But what God asks you to do is he says, wait for the right time to release that one piece. Then wait for the next piece. Then wait for the next piece. Can you hold it and wait and be patient? Do you have what it takes when that pressure comes to say, no, it's not just about saying everything God has given. It's about saying what God has given at his time. Always listening to his voice because his voice is the one who gives the whole thing in the beginning, but it's also his voice that says, hey, speak that now. Take us there now. Do that now. Okay, and God will give you, uh, he gives words for people, individuals. He'll speak to you and say, hey, this is a word for that individual. It doesn't mean it's always the right time to give it. And so you have to develop the skill. Can I hold that? In his word, he will show you something. And you get really excited. This is amazing. This is awesome. This is the best thing. And then you have to learn to hold it until God speaks to release it. Now, this is good news. Did you, this, is a good, this is a good sermon for you today. Who wants that strong internal system? We want that. We're tired of being overwhelmed. We're tired of <clears throat> um, just popping, cracking when we're going through stuff, right? Um, who has found that uh, when something goes wrong, everything goes wrong at the same time? Anybody realize that yet? Um, it's not, it's, it's like your relationships you've had your whole life, they go away and your car breaks down and your kids get really sick and then you catch what they're getting and then you have a family crisis, you have to go out of town, but you don't have money to go out of town and then you lose your job and this is how life goes. Now I have learned to look at those situations as this is a test of my internal system. This is a test, do I have macrothymia? Do I have the strength inside to endure, persevere, press on, while externally there is great pressure. And how, so how do we get that? How do we see this fruit of great heartedness grow in our lives? As Grant um, taught us a couple weeks ago, if you want the fruit of joy, you need to cultivate the soil in your heart for it to grow by learning to? Rejoice. Oh, Two people remember. 
<laughs> and Grant was one of them. <laughs> we'll still count you. You cultivate the soil in your heart to have the fruit of joy by learning to rejoice. Okay? It, it's, it's not a work in that um, rejoicing doesn't tr- equal joy. Rejoicing gets you positioned and ready for the, sp- the, f- the spirit to grow joy right. in your life. Right. But you do have to learn to rejoice. Notice Paul says, um, if you live by the spirit, you need to s- keep in step with the spirit. Right. You have to keep in line with the spirit. It doesn't just happen by you just sitting there and saying, okay, yeah, I got the Holy Spirit. Now this is just going to happen automatically. No, I have to intentionally stay in line with the Spirit. And as I do that, my heart is going to be positioned to grow the fruit. All right? So if I want to have joy, I have to learn how to rejoice. Kim taught us last week, if you want peace in your life, this fruit of the Spirit of peace, you must learn to radically trust God. This is something you actually have to step into consistently practice, learn, learn to trust him. Okay. You're not just going to naturally automatically have peace by just sitting there and claiming over and over you have peace. No, I need to walk and actually trust God in the situations that I have. So great heartedness, same thing. How does this promise of a great internal system actually grow in my life? Well, I have to learn. Are you ready for it? Do you guys want to know this? You must learn to wait on the Lord. This is how it happens. You learn to wait on the Lord. As you learn to wait on the Lord, the things that are putting pressure on you, crushing you, overwhelming you, begin to... um, be less and less, and they are unable to do that. It's not that they go away. It's that your internal system is so strong that they cannot press you hard enough anymore. But you must learn to wait on the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 14. Look what it says. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Again, I'll say it. Wait on the Lord. How y'all doing? Are, you, are your brains awake right now? Are your minds alert? Here's, here's the thing. The, the Hebrew word wait there is kava. And it is in the uh, pet all verb form. And I'm just telling that for three people in here. Because we're going to do Genesis in the fall. And if you remember about Hebrew verb forms, I'm going to give you a gold star. Okay, because in the fall, you're going to learn more about Hebrew word and word structure and all that stuff than you ever wanted to know. So if you remember the Hebrew verb structure, pet all, I'm going to give you a gold star. But here's the thing. That verb structure, it is an active waiting. It changes weight to something more like to lie in weight. You can think of like a lion or a tiger uh, in the grass waiting intensely focused on what they are doing. And what are, what, are you, what are you focused on? What are you waiting for? He says right here, the Lord. Yeah. That's right. Everything else goes away to this intense, active, expectant waiting on the Lord. I'd say that so you know. The psalmist is not talking about just sitting there, taking a nap, doing nothing. He's actually talking about really taking hold of your thoughts, of your feelings, and and getting rid of all other distractions, all other focus, and saying, I am here focused, waiting expectantly on the Lord to move by. And uh, we have to learn how to do that because in our world, we have an extremely divided focus. We're used to having a divided focus. So many things going on. Uh, Again, I'll go back to rushing, moving quickly through things. Um, The reason we move quickly is not because um, 
not, not just for the sake of moving quickly, not just because we want to. The reason you move quickly is you have so many different things going on. You have to go quick to get to the next one, get to the next one, get to the next one. Does that make sense? Yeah. See, but patience will teach you, no, one focus, one focus, wait on the Lord. What is the Lord saying? What is the Lord telling you to do? What is, how is the Lord moving? Get rid of all the other stuff, slow down, one focus. Again, like that lion in the tall grass, you're waiting for that one thing. Narrowed vision, all your senses are towards one thing. The early Christians, and really Christians throughout history, they were a lot better at this than we are. On a, on a big scale level, on a cosmic level, they were waiting with expectancy for the Lord to return for resurrection. I, I would just want you to think, when was the last time your focus of your life was wholly on this, I'm waiting for the return? We've lost that. We've lost that. We need, to, <clears throat> we need to learn how to wait for the Lord on the big scale, his return, his coming. We need to learn how to wait for the Lord in a corporate setting, waiting for the Lord as a church, and we need to learn how to wait on the Lord individually. Yeah. That's it, right there. You gotta have all three. So on the big scale, look what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, 8. He says, we're hard pressed on every side. You remember our balloon? We're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Uh, that's Paul saying, we're going through a lot of stuff. There's a lot of pressure to the point of persecution, physical violence um, being enacted on them. But that is bringing life to others. Verse 13, he says, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to him. Now I want you to see what's going on. Why are we able to go through this, endure this? Why are we pressed and not crushed? Because we know our focus is here. The Lord will return and he will resurrect us as he was resurrected. It's this intent intense focus on this promise of the Lord's return and resurrection. How y'all doing? Some of you haven't ever had this thought cross your mind yet because it hasn't been presented to you. Today's your day. As people uh, that follow Jesus, we are to have this patient, active, waiting focus on his return and that it can happen at any moment. And resurrection. And that gave them this is the cool part. That gave them this strong internal system that says we're pressed, but it's not crushing us because we've learned to wait on the Lord in the sense of his coming. Verse 15, all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, we're dying, we're being beat up, inwardly. Remember our word, inwardly. Our internal system is being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Are you noticing Paul's focus? He's got all kinds of other things pressing on him, pushing on him, but he's saying there is this eternal glory that's so much greater than all of that. And we're waiting patiently for that and we're able to endure and press through for that and then he says verse 18 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Um, Disclaimer, we are a charismatic church. And uh, I love what the charismatics have done in... um, just presenting the Holy Spirit and his moving and his continued move, continuing move, that has been a great service for the church as a whole. I'm so grateful for that. And again, we are part of that charismatic heritage and tradition. Um, so because, you know, we're related to them and part of it, I can call it ugly when I need to. Because here's the thing. Leave it to charismatics to just make up something about what that verse means because they do that all the time. Um, and what, what you will often hear is when Paul says, focus on what is unseen, um, he's talking about the spirit world, like the unseen spiritual world. Don't fix your eyes on this natural world, fix your eyes on the unseen spiritual world. And I think if you just read that chapter, you would see that's not what he's talking about. It's funny to me because like the core of our Christian faith the thing that, that makes Christianity what it is is that God became seen. You ever thought about that? Anyway, it's just a, little, just a little thing. I'll get off my soapbox on that for a second. What Paul is saying in the context of the scripture is he's saying we are focused on the eternal glory that we're waiting for. Uh, we're focused on the resurrection that we're waiting for, the return of Jesus that isn't seen yet, but we're waiting for it. We're intensely focused on that unseen reality that will be seen someday, but right now it's not. We're not focused on what we can see right now. We are patiently waiting, enduring through, focused on that stuff that's unseen. Again, the return, the resurrection, the eternal glory. And that has given them the great heart to endure through the pressing, the the crushing, the um, perplexing, confusing moments, the despair, the abandonment. They're able to go through all that and not be destroyed because they have the single focus on that unseen stuff, the return of Jesus, the resurrection that will come, and the eternal glory that far outweighs all the stuff you can see right now. We got to learn. We got to reclaim how to wait on the Lord in his return. We have to learn how to wait corporately. Wait on the Lord. Um, We we learn from people and we learn from great uh, (laughs) women. That's a new way to say it. Men and women. If you want to say them both quickly, (laughs) women. We learn from great men and women of God. And uh, we learned the Bible, and I've been taught uh, the scripture. We learned from great men and women of God. We learn about the kingdom um, from great men and women of God. We learn how to pray. Did you know you need to learn how to pray? The disciples went to Jesus and said, hey, can you teach us how to pray? We have to learn how to pray. We learn how to worship. We learn a lot of things. Um, and and there's, there's great people out there that you can listen to and you can learn from when it comes to the scripture, when it comes how to pray, when it comes how to worship, and we should do that. We should be learning. But I have found it very difficult to find people who can teach you how to wait on the Lord. In fact, I've looked high and low and I can't find anybody currently alive that really can teach how to wait on the Lord. But the best one that I have found, um, he's not alive anymore, but the person I have learned the most from, that I have watched over and over again and and received from on how to wait on the Lord is John Wimber, who's the founder of of Vineyard Churches. And he did a lot of great things for the church. Um, Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is the only thing. But if you watch him, He's been gone a long time, um, but you can still watch his services and things on YouTube. Um, I encourage you, go to YouTube, type in Wimber-Dash 
Baptism of the Holy Spirit, 0712. I don't know what those numbers mean. That's just what the video is called. Wimber dash baptism of the Holy Spirit, 0712. And I've given all the small groups an assignment as well this week. Watch the first 15 to 20 minutes of that video. And you, I'll tell you this, you are not going to get any great teaching there. You are not going to hear any great worship music going on. You are going to watch a guy and a congregation of people really wait on the Lord. And I'll tell you, I have watched, I've probably watched that video 50 times, just over and over and over, and I'm not learning any theology, and I'm not learning any Bible, and I'm not hearing great worship songs. I'm watching what he's doing and what his team and the people are doing to wait and watch and expect and anticipate the Lord moving. We have to learn how to do this, how to wait on the Lord. And it's tough. I get it. Because when you're, in, <clears throat> when you're in church, or I can speak to this, when you're on stage, you feel pressure of what are people thinking? What are they thinking of me? Are they getting hungry? How are the kids doing in the back? There's all these pressures going on. And to be able to stand there and say, Lord, I'm, not, I'm getting all those distractions out of the way. I'm focused on you, and I'm looking for you to move one time. Like that lion in the grass, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm lying and waiting for him to move. This is my one desire, my one aim. Where is God waiting on him? That, it's in that place where you have cultivated the soil of your heart for that great heartedness, that strong internal system to be produced. So are you all ready for that? Okay. Here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> I'm just going to take you through uh, what I do to learn, or what I've been doing, to learn to wait on the Lord every day. We do this every day, and you don't have to do it my way, but I know sometimes it's helpful to just have it modeled for you so that you have something to go off of. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. I want you to sit up. If you're asleep, wake up, please. <laughs> just a second. <clears throat> so I like, I'm just going to walk you through what I do. I like to sit up straight because I'm not here to take a nap. I'm not here to be comfortable. Right? I'm here to wait on the Lord intently, so I get myself in a posture that uh, isn't like, you know, I'm just, I'm just chill. I'm just saying, no, I'm here to wait on the Lord. And if my body's slightly uncomfortable, I feel like that's good for me because it keeps me alert. So I'm sitting up straight. Put my hands out. So put your hands out in front of you. We just say this simple prayer. But before we do that, I just want to walk you through a few things. <clears throat> um, you want to be yeah. intent and focused on the Lord. We're waiting for him. Pay attention to the thoughts that come into your mind. Pay attention to feelings you're having, feeling emotion. Remember, we're not just sitting here passively for nothing. We are actively waiting. Pay attention to your body. We've talked about this a lot before, but body, do you feel heat anywhere? Do you feel that tingling anywhere? Do you feel trembling anywhere? Is there any difference in your body? And, and I'll just say this. I know people have a hard time with the body thing. That's because we've been taught there's a separation between your spirit, soul, and body. But I'll tell you just real quickly, the biblical view would say, yeah, it is totally God that he can trigger something in your brain that releases chemicals to your body and makes you feel a certain way. And that doesn't make it any less God, right? Right? He can touch your heart, and it can pump blood, and it can do... People get real twisted up on that. They're like, oh, I'm just making this up, or I know my body responds that way. And I'm just telling you, the biblical authors would be telling you, what, what are you talking about? Of course God can interact with your body. Did he not create your body? Okay, so pay attention to your body, your physical self, intently focused on the Lord. Others of you... Because we're in a corporate setting, this will happen. Um, you may not feel, see, think, hear anything internally at all. Your task is to see God moving on other people. 
Because just because he's not moving and you don't feel him on you does not mean he's not in the room. It's like the wind blows, it hits the trees, and you see it there because the trees move. Does that make sense? God blows, and he moves through this place, and you see it there because it's on other people. And that's your task, is to recognize him moving on other people to know, oh, there he is. I've been waiting. He has moved. All right? You all got it? Okay. We're sitting up straight. Hands out. Let's take just a deep breath just to relax. Everybody's going to be okay, I think. And then i just like to say this simple prayer and then just wait on him. Come, merciful Father. Come, precious Son. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. 